Warning, this episode contains details that some listeners may find disturbing. In January of 1935, one of the most perplexing unsolved murders of the 20th century was committed. Roland T. Owen was found covered in blood in his small hotel room after seemingly acting very odd during his stay at the President Hotel in Kansas City, Missouri. A lot of details make this case strange, but one of the most peculiar is that Roland T. Owen was found alive, but beaten, strangled, and stabbed. He was asked who attacked him, and Roland's response was, nobody. This is a study of strange. Welcome to A Study of Strange. I'm Michael, and today's guest is RJ Blake. Welcome, RJ, or re- welcome back, I should say. Thanks for having me back. Thanks for having yeah. me back, Michael. Very excited. Yes. It's strange again. Yes, my, my strange buddy. So RJ is a producer and writer on another podcast called Strange Phenomenon, and you sometimes, like, kind of do some hosting duties on that show too, correct? Sometimes I'll, I'll uh, conduct the interviews and we release yeah. uh, the full interviews as kind of supplemental material. So, yep, I do pop up there time to time. Yes, it, I, I'm a big fan of the podcast. Everybody should check it out. RJ is also a filmmaker and writer. Is there any? Are there any projects you want to kind of point to right now? Uh, the most recent stuff I've been doing is uh, working on Watchers series, uh, Ghost Files and Mystery Files. They're available on YouTube. I'm a, If you listen to this podcast, it's very much in the same yes. vein. <laughs> very much the same vein. So you'll love it. Yeah. yeah. If you like the genre of this show, definitely check out RJ's work. And it's so nice to have you back just because you are knowledgeable about these topics and today's today's a doozy. This is a popular story that does appear in a lot of strange podcasts and literature and blogs and videos and everything else. But it's just such a good one that I, I had to do it. And like I like to do on this show is I try to weed through a lot of the craziness and rumors that start with these kind of tales and kind of bring it back to uh I shouldn't even say bring it back to, but just make it simpler so it's a little easier to understand and maybe even solve if you weed through all the crazy rumors and tales that happen within true crime and strange phenomena stories out there. Today, we are delving into the haunting and still unsolved murder, sometimes called the Ogletree murder, sometimes called the Owen murder or the murder at the President Hotel. We will get into why there are (laughs) multiple names soon, and it's a perfectly strange case. And it took place in Kansas City, Missouri. Not Kansas City, Kansas, but Kansas City, Missouri. Easy mistake. Easy, very easy mistake. I will point out one of my main sources of information today is Kansas City Magazine had an article Uh, relatively recent in history, where they actually got to go through all the old police files. And most of the articles you read about this story, they never got the old police files. So it was a a great source, and I will link to that in my show notes. Everybody check that out if you're interested. And to start us off here, I'm going to read a quote from that Kansas City Magazine article to get us going. So here we go. His brutal murder has long fascinated true crime writers and podcasters, probably because the facts are so bizarre. A victim who used his last breaths to deny being beaten to death, a mysterious man named Don Kelso, who was later tied to another gruesome slaying, letters sent to the victim's mother after he died but before she knew of his passing, and a mysterious donor who paid for a grave and a dozen roses with a card that read, Love Forever, Luis. Excuse me. Lois. <laughs> I'm I'm great at hosting, RJ. I'm we're uh, we're at, sol- we're solving the uh one yeah. mystery right now. The mystery of also, Luis versus Lois. Exactly. I, I'm not exactly sure because you can spell them both the same way. Right? Maybe not. Uh, no. give me give me an give me an email, everybody out there. Tell me how I'm wrong. A study of strange at gmail.com. 
Uh, so you just told me before we started recording, you've never heard of this story. I don't. Uh, I don't think so. But some of the details you're saying are popping through. Yeah. So I'm going to take us back to 1935, RJ. Get in the old Wayback Machine. <laughs> so it's January 2nd, 1935. The bustling streets of Kansas City, Missouri are alive with the usual buzz of post-holiday activity. And amidst this, a man enters the opulent lobby of the President Hotel. He's well-dressed, he's in his early 20s, and he has a scar on his scalp that's visible through his hair. And some say that he has a deformed ear, sort of sometimes called a, a cauliflower ear. There is an air of mystery about this guy because he requests an interior room several several floors up and he does not have any luggage he's just carrying with him a toothbrush a comb toothpaste and some accounts claim that he also had an item wrapped in newspaper but that is an inconsistent and unconfirmed detail he is assigned room 1046 and his behavior catches the attention of the hotel staff during his time there He's mostly seen alone, but there are reports of hearing shouting coming from his room. He even asked a maid at one point, Mary Soptic, to leave the room unlocked while he stepped out, claiming he was expecting a friend. Mary Soptic returned to the room a few times during Owen's stay, and the second time she did, she found Owen sitting in the dark, fully dressed, and she told police later that his behavior made her think that he was afraid or worried about something. All right, question so far. Do you need to, is the picture getting painted clear enough? What do you need to know? It is, it is. My first thought about this guy hearing the description of him, cauliflower ear, scars on the scalp, makes me think that, uh, particularly, this is 35, you mm -hmm. said? Yeah. A boxer, perhaps? Interesting. A fighter yeah. of some yeah. kind? That's that's the first note that I've written down. Yeah, it, it's uh, you could have been a police back a police officer detective back then because that was one of the theories is that he could have been a wrestler or a boxer. Yeah, and and I will point out the cauliflower ear is very inconsistent in the stories and descriptions of him. Mm -hmm. Some say that he his scar on his head was near his ear, like above his ear. So I do question whether he actually had a cauliflower ear if the scar being near the ear gets confused and people have kind of turned it into that over time. Mm -hmm. That being said, even with the scar and stuff, they they still theorized that he might have been a boxer or a fighter. And we'll talk about that a little Has bit he more. he given a name up. so far of who he yes. is? So when he came in and signed into the hotel, he used the name Roland T. Owen. And oh, ooh, RJ's research, he's, he's typing it in right now. There are I'm some taking notes, like yeah. it's a game of Clue, right? Nice, now. nice. Uh, I will point out names in this story. So I had always heard this tale, the maid being called Mary Soptic, and or Soptic is sometimes pr pronounced that way. However, Kansas City Magazine, they refer to her as Mary Soptio. And hmm. so in my in my little outline, I was referring to her Saptio because I think that's the best reference is, is Kansas City Magazine. However, diving in a little bit more with like family records, I can find a lot of Soptics in Kansas City still to this day mm -hmm. and no Saptio. So I do think it may have been like a, a typo or something in their research. So I, I'm going to refer to her as Soptic, yeah. even though it may be Saptio. Now, the President Hotel is still there. I think nowadays it's like, Hilton, the President Hotel by Hilton, or one of the major chains. And I do want to describe the hotel room a little bit because it is important for the story. So the room is a bit smaller than we think of with modern day hotel rooms. There was a bathroom when you walked in, the bathroom was on the left. When you went further into the room, uh, there was a bed on the right wall. However, it wasn't the sort of facing the opposite wall like it wasn't perpendicular to the window is probably the best way to say it mm. it was actually up against the right wall with the headboard pointed towards the door so half the bed you couldn't get in and out of because it was up against the wall mm -hmm. does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah so is the headboard against the window no 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 other so opposite side uh, opposite. there's like all right yeah okay. so there's like a little facing the window i was like wait a minute okay okay yes, yeah and sense. so the feet are facing the window yeah At the foot of the bed is like a little sitting area and off to the left side of the room there is a little desk like a writing desk 
and lamp and stuff. Obviously, it's 35, so there's no like flat screen telly, you know, that kind of thing on the side of the wall. No USB ports, man. No USB ports can plug in your cell phone. I don't know. What did they do to charge their cell phones back then? That's a big question. Big question. (laughs) So uh, we are going to read a scene, a reenactment, RJ. And this is a a scene of Mary Soptic, the maid, coming into the room. Uh, I believe this is the third time she entered the room. So if you pull up the scenes I sent you, it's scene number one. Yeah. Do you want to read Soptic, the housekeeper, or do you want to read uh, uh, good old Roland T. Owen? You know what? I'll, I'll take Soptic. Ooh, nice, nice. All right, Let's I'll read it. the descriptions. You read Soptic. Wonderful. All right. So we're in the hallway of the President Hotel, and Mary Soptic pushes a cleaning cart down the hallway and stops in front of room 1046. She knocks on the door. Housekeeping! Come in! Soptic turns the handle to the door, but it's locked, and this strikes her as odd. She takes out her key and lets herself into the room. The room is dark, and a faint hit of sun shines through the cracked blinds in the window. She's startled by the presence of Mr. Owen, who is sitting on the bed quietly. Oh, sorry. I can come back. No, please. It's no bother. All right. She begins cleaning the room quietly, aware of the man sitting in the dark watching her. Soptic is dusting the desk when she notices a note written in pencil. Without trying to pry, she notices that it reads, Don, I'll be back in 15 minutes. Wait. Suddenly a phone rings. Soptic continues cleaning and Owen stands and crosses to the phone. He answers. "Uh Uh-huh. I don't want to eat. I'm not hungry. I just had breakfast. Elwood hangs up the phone. Do you need anything else? I'm all done for now. No, thank you. More towels, perhaps? Maybe later. She leaves. Later on, Soptic returned with towels, and as she steps up to the outside of the door to room 1046, she can hear arguing voices inside the room coming from two men. Two men argue. (laughs) She knocks. Housekeeping, fresh towels. And from inside the room, we don't need any, we don't towels. Need any towels. Perfect, perfect. There we go. Awesome. Uh, yes. So, I want to point out at the beginning of that when she first was told to enter the room and she found it locked and she found it odd. This is one of the key bits of information of this story and why it's so strange. The hotel rooms. Much like some hotel rooms today, there's a way to lock the door from inside where you can't open it from outside. Mm-hmm. But if it's locked with the key from outside the door, you can't unlock it inside. So he was mm. essentially the best way I that you can describe it, I probably made that sound way too confusing, is it was locked from the outside. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yes. And I always thought that was very weird whenever I would hear about this story. But sure enough, the maid actually talked about it like to the police of like, this is really weird because the door was definitely locked from the outside the way the locks work. He wouldn't have locked it like that from inside. He can't. So that is a a key detail of this strange mystery. Mm. Mm. Uh, I will also point out some stories or some articles that you read say that uh, Don in the note, because it's like, Don, I'm, I'll am i be back. Wait, some reference this as meaning it's a note to Don. Does it feel like it's a, a like, a, so this note, mm-hmm. it's at his desk. The wait, that feels more like a, like a telegraph almost, doesn't it? It does, but it's written in pencil. So it, although a telegraph would have said, um, stop, not stop. wait. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good, question though because it could have i wonder if there is a way that he was received in a telegram but he like just wrote what was on it to himself to remember no 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 no. i'm thinking out loud so more arguing was heard that day but i can't find details of what specifically was coming from 1046 and in the police investigation the couple in the room next door claimed they heard arguing and noises that night after midnight and i'll I'll get to that in a little bit more detail in a bit uh before i get ahead of myself though That night, the switchboard operator saw that the phone in room 1046 was off the hook, and the operator sent a bellboy up to check on it. And the bellboy, when it got to the room, knocked on the door, but it was locked. 
and he heard from inside, come in, but he can't get the door open. He's not using his key. So he just yells, put the phone back on the hook through the door and thought that would have solved the issue. But around 7 a.m., an operator noticed that the phone was off the hook again and sent someone else up. And this bellboy also yelled through the door, put the phone back on the hook and heard a response like, all right, or okay, because they weren't going in. And then at 8.30 a.m., the phone was still off the hook and bellboy Harold Pike was sent up and he couldn't, you know, he didn't hear anything. So he let himself into the room with his key. And what he found was chilling. What he does, though, is a bit baffling. (laughs) Pike saw a man naked in bed, breathing heavily, and he saw dark spots on the sheets but he assumed that it was like shadows because the room is, is really dark. So he just went in, grabbed the phone, put it on the hook and left. So later, I think around right. 10. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So later around 10, 1030, the phone is off the hook again and a bellboy is sent up. And this time the bellboy found Owen on his knees in the bathroom, naked, covered in blood. Apparently blood is everywhere. A a quick point of contention, most accounts say that he was on the floor. Hmm. However, the police notes say that he was found in the bathroom when the bellboy went up. Um, So I just want to point that out because usually you you hear that he was on the floor. And I don't know which is right because there could be a mix up because he was found in the bathroom later. So it could be a mix up. But in the original notes, he was found in the bathroom. Is the bellboy bathtub or like? In the bathroom, floor. in the bathtub. Yeah, good, yeah, good yeah. question. Good, good question. And the bellboy did probably what I would do, and that's he got the fuck out of there. It was like, ah, what do I do? And like, they called the police. They called doctors. Uh, the doctors show up. Police show up, and they find Owen in the bathtub. When they go up, for sure, in the bathtub, <clears throat> he has a t- cord tied around his neck, his ankles, his wrists. He's stabbed multiple times. His skull is fractured from blows to the head. And the doctor estimates the attack must have been around six to seven hours earlier. Owen is still alive, not doing well, as you can imagine, but he is still alive. And we are now going to quickly read our short second scene of the day, scene number two. And do you want to read uh, Owen or the detective? Let's keep continuity. I'll do detective this time. Nice, nice. All right. A doctor works on bandaging Owen, who is still sitting in the bathtub and fading quickly. Detective Johnson stands at the doorway and knows he must ask questions quickly before Owen passes out. Who is here with you? Nobody. How did you get hurt? I... I... I fell. I fell against the the bathtub. Did you try to commit suicide? No. No. Oh, Owen loses consciousness. Yeah, so he's tied, he's stabbed, but, you know, he fell and hit hit the bathtub. That's his explanation. Adding to the strangeness of this story, RJ, it's so strange. Yes. Um, So Owen is rushed to the hospital. I'm sure they took the cord and, you know, untied him before they did all that. I would would hope that they tidied him up real fast. Yeah, yeah. And the only things found in his room the only things is a label from a necktie. So like it was ripped off or fell off or torn off a hairpin, a cigarette and no clothes. So not just like he didn't show up with luggage. If you remember, not like, yeah. Oh, he didn't have luggage, but his literal clothes are gone. And that's so one of the reasons. Toothbrush. So is his comb. That's a good point. I didn't even think about that. His comb and yeah. toothbrush are gone too. Cause that's all they found apparently. Now, some accounts will say that there was a glass, like a drinking glass with women's fingerprints on it. Some accounts will say that there was an, a, a small unopened bottle of acid, a type of acid. However, I cannot find any confirmation to that. And like the the better- it Sounds like Dashiell Hammett is. is the one yeah, who right? like, wrote <laughs> that down. Yeah. Like, uh, I came in and uh, <laughs> there was a Dame's fingerprints on there. Yeah, there's Dame's fingerprints. Uh, get them in here, boys. Yeah. I don't know. Um but no, so it, apparently uh, it's just a hairpin, necktie label, and cigarette. 
I do think there's a mistake about the fingerprints of a woman on a glass because I'm going to read to you a, an article that came out just like a day after this happened. And it, like I like to do when I research stuff is find things from the time, mm-hmm. you know, before it's been all muddied up with stuff. Telephoned. Yes. So here we go. This is from the Kansas City Star. He was found naked shortly after 11 o'clock yesterday in the 10th floor room he had occupied Wednesday night, Thursday and Thursday night. His neck, wrists, and ankles were bound with cord. The right side of his skull was fractured by blows, and a small knife hole below his heart had been penetrate, had penetrated the lung. Blood had spattered on the side of the wall nearest the bed, and drips of blood even had reached the ceiling. Four small-sized fingerprints, possibly a woman's, were found on the glass top of the telephone stand near the bed and possibly constitute additional clues. An initial check of the fingerprints of the slain man at the Bureau of Investigation of the Department of Justice at Washington, where they were sent via wire photo, disclosed they are not on record there. The questions, questioning of Ira Johnson, William Eldridge, and Sergeant Frank Howland detectives had yielded no clue as to how the clothing was secreted, whether it was taken out of the hotel early yesterday morning by the murderers, or whether it was hidden in the building. Ele- elevator operators, maids, and bellboys cannot recall seeing or hearing any unusual sounds or exits of persons from the room or the 10th floor in the hours when the murder likely was done and the perpetrators escaped. So I, I will share this too, because there is a, a bit about a woman hearing voices The man and woman who occupied an adjoining room Thursday night told Detective Johnson that after midnight, they heard voices indicating two men and two women were in the room used by Owen. And essentially, I won't keep reading it too much, but essentially they heard four people, two men, two women, Mm -hmm. in the adjoining room, 1046. After midnight, around two o'clock, they heard two of the voices yelling, with you know, unkind language. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then later on, they heard like heavy breathing, like almost like choking or snoring, weird, uh, strange snoring sounds, which could have yeah. been after he was attacked. Um, Yes. So was he positive? Was, is the idea here or a theory that he was already stabbed when the person came in for the phone and saw him naked laying on yes. the bed with the blood ever yes. stains where blood was blood could the fingerprints have been his could he have had though the bellboy yeah woman hands oh uh, yeah i guess I, I guess it could because i i'm not sure the police would have even thought to consider the fingerprints of the bellboy but maybe they did because they they questioned and and went through all this because i have very small hands too i could see my hands <laughs> my fingerprints they'd be like that, yeah. There's no way that could be a man's fingerprint. Right, right. Very possible. Uh, it is very possible. I, I bet they did. It seems like they they did put a lot of thought into this. They did talk to everybody. So I do think they would have considered that. And yeah. just to clarify some of the timing, the arguing was heard between like two, three in the morning. Mm-hmm. And that bellboy saw the you know what he thought was shadows, but was most likely blood. Uh, that was around 7 a.m., if I'm remembering correctly mm. from my own notes. Mm-hmm. So, it, the, yeah, it was definitely hours after the attack. And it's almost like Owen was in bed struggling just to even, like, stay conscious and in the delirium of what's happening could have been like, I got to get to the bathroom to clean up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, he also may have tried to make a phone call or he just stumbled into the phone and kept knocking it off the hook or, you know, something like that. Maybe you'll get to this later, but is there anything known about Owen before he gets to the hotel? We, because we this guy's already, I mean, just from the first description of him, this guy is a guy who's led a hard life, you know? Yeah. It's like you've it's like you've seen my outline, RJ. <laughs> it's like I've get consumed way too much true crime stuff over the years. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. what it's more like. Yep. yep. No, so Owen, it is quickly established by the police who are now investigating that Owen is probably a fake name. Uh mm. Roland T. Owen. Also, he didn't leave a specific address when he signed into the hotel. He just said Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Uh I do also want to point out I I have a picture of and a lot of people do it's out there of his like hotel registry card or whatever and everybody always says Roland T Owen I'm even saying that because all the research says it but to my eyes it looks like Roland S 
Owen is what he wrote. And part of me is like, do I just not understand cursive anymore? Because we live in a world where no one writes it. So maybe his handwriting is weird and everybody else knows it's a T, but I look at it and I see an S. Oh, yeah. I yeah. Mean, distinctly possible. My my signature looks like an S and it's a giant R. Yeah, yeah. But regardless, it is a fake name. And we yeah. will find out more about that soon. So uh, police investigate. They interrogate everybody at the hotel. They recount Owen's peculiar behavior, his insistence on a room several floors up and interior of the hotel, his request to sort of stay in the dark and be with the lights off even when the maid came in. There are coincidental stories that come up because this this story does get published in the paper immediately and spreads around town. So everybody has their own theories and people like witnesses do. People are like, maybe I witnessed something. So there are these coincidental accounts of someone seeing a guy with a briefcase leaving the hotel and people thinking it's weird, but it was at a time when it was probably just a guest of the hotel. There's uh, just a million other of these coincidental stories that you will hear if you look into this story, including like a prostitute wandering around that floor that night, but she apparently did not go to room 1046. How they know that... um, it's probably the police probably talked to some people and they didn't want to get too detailed about it. Uh, but they they kind of quickly write that off. And the investigation expands as much as it can. The police comb through other hotel registers looking for clues. They do find that he stayed at other hotels in Kansas City. Hmm. And sometimes when he was at these other hotels, he was with another gentleman. And that gentleman would use the name Don Kelso at hotels. But they could not find any record of this man. They couldn't find out who Don Kelso was. It's also likely that's a fake name. And the police release a description of Owen, hoping that someone will identify him. No one does. So they do something else. The The funeral home actually leaves out the body <laughs> so that people can come by and like, can you identify this guy? We don't know who this John Doe is. Please, please help us. He's using a fake name. And no one can identify him. Now, the Kansas City police, they're grappling with a lack of leads. And they kind of just run into a dead end at that point because no one can identify Mm -hmm. him. The funeral home, they're going to bury the body after a period of time. And it's, I guess, published somewhere, local papers probably. They're just going to bury him in a kind of a cheap plot somewhere. But then they start getting anonymous calls from a gentleman that, he says he wants to pay for a better grave. And there's a bunch of weird stories online about what this guy was saying, including like, oh, oh, Roland T. Owen spent time with my sister years ago. He deserves to be buried next to her. I cannot find any corroborating evidence to that. That's all like one of those games of telephone over the years. Mm-hmm. However, according to Kansas City Magazine, in the original police files, the guy who called when he was asked, like, what's your relationship to this person? He said, Owen hadn't played the game fair and cheaters usually get what's coming to them. And that's all that's in the original police file. So uh, that's weird. Also, after he was he was buried, flowers were sent. And I mentioned this earlier in the episode. There's a note from Lois or Louise, Mm -hmm. uh, (laughs) however you want to say it. And no one knows who that is or what the relation could be. That also could theoretically be a mistaken identity. Um, like whoever paid for it may have thought this was somebody else. Using what was that it. note again? The uh, lowest. Let note. me pull that up. It's uh, d- d- love forever, Louise mm. slash Lois, aka mm. Louis. Um, <laughs> no, it's just love forever, <laughs> Louis. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting indeed. Now, is that where everything ends? That's kind of where it ends for a couple years. Okay. So here's it. Get, it's going to get a little bit more strange. So almost two years later, there's a break in the case because a woman named Ru- Ruby Ogletree was reading about the story in a magazine and the description of the deceased man matched her missing son, Artemis Ogletree. Now, I Artemis have read, Ogletree. Artemis Ogletree. One of the greatest names in the history of true crime, for wow. sure. Truly. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I I have read that the Artemis's sister is the first one to found this. I don't know if that's true or not, but what I do know is Ruby, the mom, is the one that contacted authorities, went mm-hmm. to Kansas City, trying to figure this out. They compare Owen's finger tips, uh, finger tips, fingerprints uh, to Roland T. Owen, and it does prove that Roland T. Owen is, in fact, Artemis Ogletree. So uh, let me tell you a little story about Artemis Ogletree. So Artemis Ogletree was a young man from Birmingham, Alabama. He had left home in April of 1934 seeking to travel. And as I uh, comedically want to say, maybe sow his wild oats, you know, yeah. you know, see the world. He traveled around with his friend Joe Simpson. And according to Simpson, they separated in Los Angeles. Ogletree's family received three letters from him after he left, the last of which was sent in August of 1934. So that's... Uh, a little less than a year before all this happened. Mm-hmm. The letters the family later realized were not in Artemis's handwriting. This revelation caused concern. What was Artemis doing in Kansas City? Why did he check in under a false name? Most importantly, who would want to harm him? The police began tracing Artemis's movements before his arrival at the President Hotel. They again learned he had stayed at multiple hotels before that, stayed with this dude named Dunn Kelso, but the investigation at Artemis's death had a series of dead ends. Witnesses were scarce, and those who might have seen him were unable or unwilling to provide useful information. And this mysterious Don, mentioned in a note in the room, uh, never materialized. And weeks turned into months. The case grew cold, and the brutal, mur- brutal murder of Artemis Ogletree in room 1046, the President Hotel, became one of Kansas City's most enduring mysteries. A tale of intrigue and unanswered questions so, that continue to mystify. Yes, questions, because there is a little bit more to the story. Oh, Go for oh, it. Oh, oh, hey, no, no, oh. please, please, tee it up. Yeah, what, do, what do you got? What do you got? They're sure that Joe Simpson is not Don, right? There, they somebody had to go look into that. That feels like the obvious yeah. angle, yeah. So, me. or at least somebody connected there, because yeah. If you're saying cheater, once more, we're talking, we're thinking. Said the boxer thing once. He could have cheated in a fight. Maybe he didn't take. Maybe he took, either took a fall. We've heard this story before, or didn't take a fall and yeah. won even more money by not taking a fall, or. Cheated on a woman. There were two women. So there's yeah. that. That's a that's another thought. Or gambling would be my last guess. Yeah, you know, you're hitting on a lot of things. And and I was going to get into theories a little bit later, but I'm going to bring up uh, a couple of them right now because you, you just did. Kansas City. Little Little history for you. Yeah. Kansas City in the 1930s, big mob town. Got so it. there was prohibition that I'm sure was was a big, big reason why. But it is a big mob town. And even the sheriff uh, or police chief, I forget which one, of the Kansas City area, uh, I can't remember if it's at this time or right after it, but he ended up going to prison for all sorts of terrible things associated with the mob and mafia. So even the, the police authorities are somewhat involved as you'd expect in that time period in places mm-hmm. where the mafia has or organized crime has a big influence now uh, so that's where a lot of theories are like he could have easily gotten mixed up with the wrong people in a town like Kansas City whether that's gambling whether it's hey maybe it, maybe it even could have been fighting or wrestling maybe he's he's taking falls for guys and setting mm-hmm. up things um the the big other theory besides some sort of tie-in with the mob or organized crime is a love affair. The more I get into it, we'll finish the story here in a second, but the more I get into it, the less likely I am to think that. I, I'm more likely to think that there's some kind of tie-in with a criminal aspect to this. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like a crime of passion to me because of the interactions with Dawn that we had heard before. Yeah. So yeah. Women don't come into play until 
they hear the arguing in the room, right? And and, and, and also I should point out too, I, I do believe the witnesses, but witness testimony you always have to take with a grain of salt. True. Maybe they didn't hear women's voices. Maybe the way sound ricochets off the walls and down the hallway and through the wall, maybe they thought they heard women's voices, but maybe it was just some guys or a guy. Um, so Because no one ever saw women with him. Mm-hmm. There's just mm-hmm. the the idea of we heard something. So, but there's been one guy that they've seen that has been seen with him, <clears throat> or at least talked about. Yeah, or at least yeah. talked about. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and also the the attack to me. Maybe I've watched too much television, but the way he's tied, beat up, stabbed that to me says I'm sending a message. It doesn't mm-hmm. say love affair gone wrong i think that would have been more passion this there's there's something personal it's in also a way that's just different yeah it's also like very um thought out there was obviously planning and play in this situation which is not very typical for a crime of passion which usually yeah, yeah. happens spur of the moment spur yeah. of the moment yeah mm-hmm. And also, I I think, and and maybe I'm wrong, and please out there let me know if I'm wrong, but I think in those kind of situations, maybe you have a jealous boyfriend or husband or something like that, I don't think they would take the time to tie up, stab, beat. To me, it's just like a quick gunshot, some stabs. You know, it tends to happen much faster. Again, I could be wrong. That's just my own assumption about that. But anyway. Well, here's here's another thing, and maybe you cover this, and I'm missing it so the first time he's seen he's in bed that's uh naked he most likely is bleeding out at that point there's blood yeah is he tied up at that point or do we know or is he just found tied up later he's only found tied up later but that doesn't mean he was he wasn't tied up in bed it was dark right and i think the the bellboy was just like oh this is this is so weird i'm just gonna like yeah, yeah yeah exactly and i think he assumed he was drunk and like you know, right. out of it. Um, so I don't think the bellboy got a no- good enough look to say or not. I would assume he was tied up, but I could be wrong. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's there's a little bit more to this story. And I love that you brought up the guy traveling with him because mm-hmm. I have I have some thoughts about that too. And I think so does Ruby, uh, Artemis's traveling, or, or, or Artemis's mom about the traveling mm-hmm. companion. So- Artemis's mom, Ruby, received a typewritten letter weeks after Roland was killed. Remember, she doesn't know he's dead yet. It's almost two years later. And it was allegedly from her son, from Artemis, and it said he was going to New York. And she always thought the letter was strange because Ogletree didn't know how to type. I will say it's easy to learn how to type, but because you can you can just finger it. You know, <laughs> that sounds terrible. You can just use one, one finger motion. Um, yes. And and type out a letter. But the nature of the letter itself doesn't sound like her son. Apparently, he was not a very eloquent writer. He was very like simple and to the point when he wrote letters to his mom. And these letters had more to them. They were more eloquent. There were longer sentences. So it just didn't sound like him. Huh. Months later, she got another typed letter saying that he was going to France. And then at some point, she got a long distance phone call from Memphis from someone claiming to be friends with her son. And this man named himself Godfrey Jordan, and he claimed to have met Artemis in Egypt. And it was odd, but again, she doesn't know he's dead. It's just weird. And she ends up, after they discover the body and everything, she ends up thinking that whoever was traveling with Artemis was involved somehow. Mm -hmm. And she later claimed that she recognized the voice of the person who called her uh, when she approached I think it was Jim Simpson, the guy that was traveling with him, and she thought she recognized his voice from the phone call. All of that's unconfirmed. All of that's sort of hearsay, but that was the mother's intuition in the situation. Was that the guy traveling with him was involved? It's definitely weird to even say like, "Oh, we split up in L.A." It's like, well, you guys had never really traveled the world. You're traveling the world together. You're young men. Yeah. Why would you just split up in L.A.? There's an also I- interesting switch from handwriting to, to type to type yeah that's very interesting particularly did did jim simpson know 
the mother at all before I don't think he left so. traveling? I don't think so. Yeah. 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 I could be wrong about that. There's very little about him that I could find. Yeah. So that's that's the aspect of the story that attracts my attention today totally. is I want to know more about him because I do suspect that he was involved somehow, whether he killed him or not. Maybe the two of them were like, hey, we met some dude that says we can make a lot of money if we do X, Y, and Z in Kansas City. And they could have gotten involved with the same people. And whether Joe was an instigator in the murder or not, he might be trying to keep quiet because he doesn't want to get himself hurt by Is knowing it Joe or who Jerry? involved. Oh, sorry. Good question. Because I've said both also. I like to keep things. Uh, I have Joe, Joe Simpson. Nimble. Joe. Yeah. Well, because the thing that is interesting to me, too, is that she starts getting these letters every from everywhere. I assume that they're postmarked to match where they say they're coming from or yeah, at least him, different yeah. parts of the world. So he leaves traveling with somebody. They say that they're going to travel the world. You're getting letters continuing traveling from around the world. There were two men heard with him. It just it if he is not involved, I that is wild. That is a yeah. bad, yeah. bad coincidence to be in, which happens. But in these situations, you gotta go with Oxum's razor sometimes. Yeah. And that that is major red flags all over the place. Absolutely. And I'm a big proponent of Occam's razor. The The simple solution tends to be the correct one. I, I'm such a proponent of that and all the strangeness that I research and love <laughs> to read about and do. And that's why I like to go back to the beginning of things. What's the story from there? What were the cops saying to the reporters? What were the witnesses telling people? Let's let's get right down to the original original story because that's more simple now i will say this all these years i've been kind of like reading or listening to podcast or whatever about this story i had never really realized that there was a suspect i think the police had some persons of interest but no one that's really jumped forward but there was a suspect hey. yeah and there was a lead it was in new york city so there was a suspect named joseph ogden and some of the detectives believe him to be the killer and ogden had killed before he had served time before, and he also had a known alias, Don Kelso. However, they could never pin it on him. They could never get him to Kansas City at the right time. Also, there was handwriting. The, the FBI analyzed the handwriting of the note that said Don in the room. They didn't match it to Ogden. However, I would point out, again, my theory about the note is I read it as Don, you know, don't wait for me or wait for me or whatever the, the note said. I don't read it as, hey, I'm Don. Here's my note. I read it as a message to Don. Yes. Um, so I don't know if the handwriting is uh, is a good thing to rely on in this, Mr. FBI. Um, <laughs> yeah. I also, yeah, I, I wonder how accurate like um, – signature comparisons were back then because my yeah. understanding is that they're still kind of shoddy today they are so, yeah. uh i know that they help for sure they could be a piece of the puzzle but i'm not sure if it's no the most airtight evidence no no but they still regardless they could still never pin it on them right right so right. they they can't line up you know timelines and all that kind of everything else they would have looked at and i i didn't write all that down because I think the important thing here is that the police did think he was a good suspect, but mm -hmm. they weren't able to get enough evidence to conclusively even even be able to bring him in. So I think we got to even if we think it could be this dude, we still have to there, there is a burden of doubt. Right. So sure. Yeah. Was Don what, um, what was his real name? Uh, name. Blah, 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 blah. That's a good one. Where'd he go? There it is. Joseph Ogden. Joseph Ogden. Mm -hmm. Was good old Joe there related to the mob? Is that why he was murdering? If uh, he had killed people before? We, we don't know. If he is, there's not direct evidence that I came across. Uh, mm -hmm. There might be evidence out there. That doesn't mean he wasn't, though. 
And, and that mm-hmm. doesn't mean he could have been on a lower level organized crime tied in. Hey, we want you to come be the muscle for a few days in this thing and whatever. Yeah. So, um, because the the mob, especially in Kansas City and stuff, we there's so many levels to organized crime. Mm-hmm. It's it's not always people that are made men that are in these stories that are like career criminals. There are smaller players and all these various activities, and these could just be small players and totally. something some sort of organized crime situation. And and that brings us to the end. Since mm-hmm. then, since the the Don Kelso tie-in, since the mom with her letters and phone calls, there's been no new information, again, mm-hmm. that I've come across to add to this cold case. And again, the primary theories are organized crime. And I already mentioned Kansas City being sort of a hotbed of, of organized crime at that time period. Um, love affair gone wrong, which I don't buy into, but that is that is a, a theory that's out there. Other people have written about personal vendettas, but I think that kind of could also be tied in with organized crime or love affairs. Like that's one of those things that's kind of like fits into I could, all that. I could definitely see, um, uh, yeah, a personal vendetta uh, of some kind. He, you know. The only thing was we hear he cheated. What? How did he cheat? He cheated. You cheated. You didn't play the game right. That doesn't feel. It was something like that, right? It was. That doesn't feel like necessarily uh, a relationship thing. Once more, to me, you didn't play the game right. That's like you either didn't pull off the job that that you were supposed to. You. There was gambling debt. So I could definitely see, I could see a world where this guy did it uh, and that Joe Simpson knew about it and maybe just Mm -hmm. didn't want to like get involved with it. Maybe he was afraid of him for some reason, but then who was sending those letters and yeah. my gut is telling me it's it's Joe Simpson. Joe, like, yeah, mine too. Because I, if he was a friend, if he was a legitimate friend, hey, I'm going to travel around with my buddy. We're going to make a life for ourselves. We're going to go out and go for our dreams. There can be this emotional tie-in where he knows something bad happened. Mm-hmm. I feel bad for the mom. I should make her feel better. She hasn't talked. Like obviously, they lost communication with the son. They think is still alive. Um, and that's but also he knows that he's traveling. He knows that he's traveling around, and he knows who the mom is. So yeah. who who does that? A friend who you're a traveling friend. with, exactly. A friend who you are supposedly traveling with knows that you're supposed to be traveling around the world. Knows where you've potentially told people that you may be going, and would have the information to get back yeah. home. Some yeah. random killer that you meet playing cards in a fight, something like that happening, they're not going to have that information. They're not going to be able to uh, cover it up in that way. I don't see that kind of person having the the foresight to be writing these letters to keep up the charade Yeah, he's alive. You know, they would kind of just like do it and be done. Yeah. You know? That's a, uh, I, I completely agree. I, I'm on the exact same page. And if it wasn't a friend that was sending the letters, none of it makes sense to me. Because if you are a killer for some kind of crime syndicate, or even, even maybe it's not even a syndicate, maybe it's just some dude that's, you know, involved with crime on his own. He has a small little, little group. Why would you be sending letters months later? You know, mm-hmm. you're, like that's not you're not like oh just in case they ever pin it on me let me send some letters just to put her off the potential it's like the mom doesn't even know the kid was in Kansas City yeah why send a letter so to me it definitely rings out as a friend and yeah. you wouldn't send that letter unless you knew something uh, bad happened but once so, there were two men in that room I you know mm-hmm. could both of those guys been involved could if the all the cops are also mobbed up at the time. Could there be a lot more information that we don't know that yeah. didn't get 
put out yeah. that they yeah. know that they are purposely covering for. It's out of every detective novel from 1930. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. For, like, for a good reason, too. For good reason, because it was real. You know, it's, yeah, it's like it was very right of harvest, basically. Yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, you know, even though a lot of those sort of qu- crime noir movies, bush, books, Dashiell Hammett, all that, they take place in San Francisco and Los Angeles and these major West Coast cities. Um, but, and, and those police departments were. Very much. <laughs> well, that's, that's how they, the, that's yeah. how, I mean, Dashiell Hammett, that's how he created this because he was a detective. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. how he, he was just pulling, I, he was obviously embellishing and the particular right, right. Falcon and stuff, but he knew it because he had been in that world. Absolutely. Uh, and it's, and my point is like, it, that isn't, just a West Coast thing at that period of time right. that was in most major cities. Mm-hmm. So, and and again, I already pointed out the police chief went to jail because of his ties to this stuff. Um, so it, it's a very plausible scenario that the police just didn't investigate it or held things back. Maybe they were good cops, but they know that if they you know report on somebody they shouldn't, they could get beat up or killed or their family could. So- they hold back a little bit. But here's a weird detail, too. Mm-hmm. The cop asks him, as he's dying, yeah. was this suicide, but he stabbed. And died. Out. Yeah. That is, you know, not to, that is an inconvenient way to kill yourself if you're going to kill yourself. It's not the and most efficient way to do it. I, it I would not be to do it. <laughs> and so it feels like that could be a cop searching for an explanation to write down that would absolve some people that they know could be involved with this. Right, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. I think we've solved this. So I think called it. We, we definitely have. I was about to say these are all assumptions, but I'm just going to go out and on the limb and say, no, we solved it. They're not we've assumptions. Solved, we've solved it. it. I think they could yeah. go make some... Uh, so arrest posthumanist arrest here. <laughs> uh put the put uh yeah. Joe Simpson and uh Don uh Kelso Kelso yeah. behind bars in the ground. I think that's yeah. fine. I think that they think can do good. it now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and look, these these cold cases, there there's a reason they stand out. Yes, it's bizarre. So this story mm-hmm. jumps to, you know, the forefront of being interesting and well, I think that this I think that this story um scratches the itch that a lot of to me like great noir scratches the itch of really giving you a very seedy side. It, it gives you a um, safe way to approach crime uh, without having to experience it yourself while having a very interesting mystery at the middle. And yeah. I think at the end of the day, people like solving puzzles. That's how a lot of people's yeah. minds work. And so you can come at it a lot of different ways because uh, the more we're talking about too I'm like yeah why did he check in under a fake name to begin with he has to know that he's going to be meeting up with this guy who Don Kelso yeah also if we're assuming that that's the correct person which I think that's if you have one murderer going around going by a a fake (laughs) name I would say that's a pretty and the name is Don Kelso I would say you have a pretty good shot at that being right. What were they meeting there for? And why were they going to get lunch, potentially get lunch together? Why do they want to get lunch? Well, Once also, more, why are sounds they... like a business deal. Of some Absolutely. Kind. And also, like, there's there's no luggage. He's been right. moving from hotel to hotel. Mm-hmm. Like, there's definitely something seedy going on. And it's all, it's all quote unquote, business related. Um, right. But what's that business? Yeah, yeah. What is that business? And that's what we're missing now. That, mm. You know, it really boils down to. Yeah, I would love to see a see a picture because it's like, call. 
my uh, my grandfather was a, a boxer. So uh, l- let me let me interrupt you real quick because you're going down a path. I was waiting to say this, and then we just the way the topic of the conversation yes. when I never got to circle around to it. The scar is apparently something he had most his life. So it was not a a boxing related thing, unless the cauliflower thing is real. Because you remember that's kind of inconsistent. Mm-hmm. The scar he had when since he was a kid. Mm-hmm. If he had a cauliflower ear, if that's not some sort of game of telephone that happened because of the scar mm-hmm. that kind of got warped and changed over time. If mm-hmm. he had a cauliflower ear, then yes, potentially boxer. I know they mm-hmm. talked about wrestling too in some of the articles. Um, but the scar he actually had most his life. Was like underground wrestling a thing back then? I imagine it wasn't like like underground wrestling is now, which is no, no. Rad, I'm sure. But. Yeah, I'm. I'm sure. I, I don't know honestly. I just know that wrestling was brought up in a few in a few things I read. I didn't dive down what was wrestling like in the 1930s. I know I have a lot of friends that are super into wrestling and wrestling history, so they could tell me. But uh, I'll shout out Matt Mazzani. Yeah, Matt Mazzani. Yeah, <laughs> uh, um, but I, I just keep going back. It's it, Joe Simpson has to be involved. Like, yeah, he just yes. has to be. Yeah, and um, so I'm saying case closed. We've solved case closed. It. You heard it here first. R.J. Blake has solved the mystery of the President Hotel murder. The Thank 70, you. Seventy, eighty-year-old mystery. I guess closer to eighty. Oh, at this no, point. night. Like, because it's 1935, it's night, it's 2004, oh. RJ. Uh. <laughs> so, I know, I know. It's, it's not right. It's so it's not, not correct. Right. Nope, nope, it's totally wrong. Uh, well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I know you already talked about the Watcher series. Is there anything else you want to, and, and also Strange Phenomenon, you're, you're wonderful. We're podcast. dropping our last three episodes of this season of Strange Phenomenon pretty soon. We don't have the date yet as we're kind of wrapping uh them up but uh we have a lot of ufo stuff coming up we cover uh we cover the hestal and lights which Mm -hmm. i think is one of my favorite topics which is kind of ufo adjacent but yeah um is a truly incredible story that has sections of it that melt my mind about its implications of how uni- the universe is formed and how matter functions. Um, it is, it, it's great. And then we have uh, our finale is going to be a two parter on all the UFO cover up stuff, UAP cover up, whistleblower, all of that coming up and the reporting, specifically focused on the reporting that went into bringing that uh, all to the public. So that's coming up. It'll drop soon. We have a whole backlog of episodes if anybody hasn't listened before. And they're great. They're they're super well done. Fascinating show. So everybody check that out. And thank you, RJ, for coming on again. We'll have to kind of you back some other time as well. It was really nice to have, have you back on the show. It was great being back. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Murder Mystery at the President Hotel. And special thanks again to RJ Blake. If you are a fan of this podcast, take a quick moment to subscribe or hit that plus button on whatever app you listen to the podcast on, and please leave a rating and review. It only takes a minute, and it is the best way to support this podcast. Additionally, we have moved our Patreon program over to Substack, where supporters of our show get additional and exclusive articles about stories of strangeness and also some exclusive audio content coming your way soon. You can find that through our website, astudyofstrange.com. If you have an idea or a story you would like us to cover on A Study of Strange, please email astudyofstrange at gmail.com. Again, that's all one word, astudyofstrange at gmail.com. We'll be back next week. Thank you and good night.